we have lost a hundred years of evolution on planet Earth. A true lost century. Huge progress was made in the 1920s, as Nikola Tesla developed energy generation technologies that could power the Earth, drawing endless free energy from the so-called empty space around us. So-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. The amount of energy in a cubic meter of space-time was 10 to the 26th power. It's a 10 with 26 zeros behind it, joules per cubic meter. And that's enough energy, even in a coffee cup, to boil all the oceans of the Earth completely away into steam. The acronym Unidentified Flying Object is a deliberately obfuscating term. And what it really is, is an alternative energy and propulsion system. They had a, a piece of, they thought was plexiglass, a rectangular piece of a plexiglass, for years before they figured out it was the energy device for the craft. And it was connected in such a manner that this device could power a very small watch up to a city. Power was determined by what the demand on it was. And so each craft had one of these. The implications of free energy go far beyond keeping the lights on in your home or running your car without gasoline. Most of the cost of making anything from growing food to constructing a skyscraper is the energy used to mine the raw materials out of the ground. Ship, process, ship again, package, and deliver. A free energy society in which the cost of manufacturing and agriculture move towards zero would mean endless abundance for everyone on Earth. They already exist. It's not like they even have to be invented. You and I, the taxpayers, have already paid trillions of dollars, literally, in super secret black budget funding to develop these systems. This is the society we could have had a century ago. We could get rid of smog, we could get rid of pollution, uh, you wouldn't even need solar panels at this point. We could change transportation in a, in a microsecond. The way we build homes would be completely different. The way we govern our lives would be completely different. And all the literally hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets that are in coal, natural gas, uranium, nuclear power, public utilities, they're all obsolete. Many people would say, well, doesn't that mean the secrecy has been a good thing? I said, well, that would be like saying we should have never come out with the automobile because the horse and buggy manufacturers would have gone out of business, or come out with computers because royal typewriters didn't get ahead of the curve and they went out of business. When we go outside and we look at our cars, we look at our airplanes, we're already looking at dinosaur technology. It's laughable where we are right now. We should be at least 100 years ahead of where we are right now. And there are still files on this issue classified top secret from 100 years ago for the same reasons, because the macroeconomic order of fossil fuels, petrodollar, a handful of industrial elites and corporations would be completely transformed. But the folks who actually call the shots in the multi-trillion dollar global economy, they don't want to see that happen. They know that if that power was you know, delineated to the average person, we wouldn't need them anymore. They don't want it today, and the likes of J.P. Morgan and others back 100 years ago didn't want it. When they found out that Tesla had passed away in the Hotel New Yorker, they came in, they had the manager of the hotel open the safe, and they took all of Tesla's papers. And this was to the director of the FBI from the Department of Defense in a turf war trying to get that information and lock it up. This is not a contested document. This has been officially released. A century of artificial scarcity has produced a destabilized, dehumanized, war-torn world, where the power and wealth have been transferred from the many to the hands of the few. If you take that on, you're going to run into the mother of all buzz saws uh, in terms of the national security state. Some of the breakthroughs in the past have been deliberately suppressed. There are 5,135, I believe it is, patents that have been confiscated under national security seizures. Now these are just the patents. 
And this is what happened to a lot of the huge breakthrough technologies like Stan Meyer, who had a car running on water. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. A lot of people don't realize that Stan Meyer had a toroidal, a donut-shaped object that put out many times more energy than you had to put into it because it was tapping into this zero-point quantum vacuum energy field. That had a national security order on it before he even got it to patent. It was seized and shut down. What we really had was a threat to the scientific establishment. I view this as the greatest strategic threat to survival of the United States and, in fact, of civilization itself. Who's going to stop this from happening? The president doesn't know it's occurring. The Congress oversight committees have no idea what's going on. And you have these people who are in the deep national security state who basically do what they want. The problem is most of these inventors think that the world's going to beat a path to their door. Unfortunately, Murder Incorporated beats a path to their door first. But free energy technology was only one half of the equation when it came to advanced extraterrestrial technology. Early research into anti-gravity technology gained momentum in the 1940s, as Adolf Hitler poured tremendous resources into developing his secret weapon, the so-called Flying Bell. Once we acquired these technologies, they were augmented with the study of retrieved extraterrestrial craft, and we created our own fleet of so-called alien reproduction vehicles. This is where Bell Labs was involved. This is where General Electric was involved. This is where a number of high-tech companies gained their knowledge. Lockheed Martin Scuck Works and EG&G and Raytheon and E-Systems and MITRE Corporation and Booz Allen Hamilton and on and on and on. I know many people who've worked in these programs. Quote, we have things flying in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you could comprehend. If you've seen it on Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. So that's coming from Ben Rich. Ben Rich, head of the Skunk Works between 1975 and 1991. This is the original letter from Ben Rich on uh, Lockheed Advanced Aeronautics Company letterhead. I am a believer, and so is Kelly Johnson. And here it says, Dear Ben, there are two categories. A, man-made UFOs. B, extraterrestrial UFOs. Dear John, yes, I'm a believer in both categories. I feel everything is possible. Many of our man-made UFOs were unfunded opportunities. In both categories, there are lots of kooks and charlatans. Be cautious, Ben Rich. We now have the technology to take E.T. home. Ben Rich, CEO, Lockheed Skunk Works. It is being covered up, but probably not for the reasons you might think. Within the intelligence communities, they have something called Ace in the whole technologies. So secret they didn't even talk about it. November 12th of 1988 was their dog and pony show, a classified military exhibit at Norton Air Force Base. And then off in a separate section of the hangar behind a curtain, which was opened up once everyone had gathered, were three of these so-called alien reproduction vehicles, or ARVs. The craft itself was hovering off the floor with no landing gear underneath it, nothing supporting it from above. To see something, uh, you know, travel across 12 miles of airspace in under a second and a half, make a couple of right angle turns, and not make a supersonic shock wave of any kind, no sonic boom, which I've personally witnessed on a number of occasions. I mean, it's just, it changes your whole perspective. There were some very good folks, like Secretary Forrestal, and others who wanted to bring the subject out but in a way where there would be contact that would be peaceful between humans and these civilizations. But there were other people who saw the big gold mine of militarism and war profiteering and the psychological warfare value. Their mandate, repeat, their mandate is to lie, deny, and deceive. There are people who've had uh, experiences with the technology that we're not able to handle it psychologically because it just it defies reality. And in this document, the CIA director, Walter Smith, says, 
I am today transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal in which it is concluded that the problems connected with unidentified flying objects appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. We have to take a step back from all the jargon and all the paranoia in Star Wars movies for just a minute and realize that it's very easy to set up a false flag operation. A false flag operation, also known as a false indication and warning, is a military tactic in which you create the illusion of a threat, often by attacking yourself and blaming the desired enemy. It's proven extremely effective at uniting the public around a perceived threat. And this is actually a, a well-known concept in military intelligence circles. We did it in the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam, where we exaggerated, if not completely staged, an attack on our naval vessels so we would stampede President Johnson and the Congress into vastly expanding the Vietnam conflict to benefit, guess who, the military-industrial complex and the war profiteers. U.S. military officials, for example, for, have have planned through a project called Operation Northwoods back in 1962 to dress up uh, Cuban refugees in, in Cuban military uniforms, have them attack Guantanamo base and kill U.S. military personnel, sink uh, U.S. military ships, and blow up uh, shopping centers in Miami, targeting, killing uh, refugees from Cuba to infuriate the American uh, population so that they can invade and occupy Cuba. It's astonishing that anybody would dare to make a recommendation like that, but they did. Then you can look at Iraq, concocted all kinds of false information about weapons of mass destruction, which Saddam Hussein did not have, and it was known in intelligence circles he didn't have, fracture that whole part of the world, and now we have ISIS. So we have to realize the machinations and manipulations that go on behind the scenes leave us very vulnerable. And the big one is this one where they could say, oh yes, the UFOs are real, but guess what? They're a threat, and we need to unite the world, like Will Smith said in the original Independence Day. Something you want to add to this briefing, Captain Hiller? No, sir. I'm just a little anxious to get up there and whoop E.T.'s ass, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Efforts on the part of a certain element within the kind of ruling structures of our planet to try to utilize the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence as an ultimate threat, the ultimate other bad guys, to justify the national security state uh, dream of locking down and putting under complete control of an authoritarian ruling class the control of the planet and the resources. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. General Douglas MacArthur. Can you realize that we, that you and I, that all of us, have actually begun the exploration of another world? We have taken the first historic step into our solar system. I am Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was one of the top scientists brought to the U.S. from Germany after World War II as part of Operation Paperclip. He invented the V-2 rocket for Adolf Hitler and became the chief architect of the Saturn V rocket for NASA's Apollo moon missions. In his deathbed confession, von Braun warned of a plot to pull off the ultimate false flag using back-engineered alien reproduction vehicles to stage an invasion from outer space. When von Braun was dying in front of me, the very first day that I met him, he had tubes draining out of his side. And he was tapping on the desk telling me, you will come to Fairchild. I was a school teacher. You will come to Fairchild and you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. The last card is the alien card. And all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. Have you 
been exposed or did you come across in, in your career and your network um, the, the false INW or, or the deceptive indication and warnings projects related to this? Yes. And what did you find out about those? Um, that's pretty cla- That's pretty hush. That's I, I don't think I should talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's where I, when I briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, that was the main subject. That is, um, yeah, that's very uh, sensitive. Yeah, it's very, very sensitive. Yeah. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Well, the only problem with that is that if you look at the technologies that permit for interplanetary and interstellar travel, it's a thousand times more developed than a hydrogen bomb, which if we were to have a massive exchange of nuclear weapons, would leave most of all life on Earth extinguished. Therefore, how could we possibly have armed conflict with another planetary system for more than a nanosecond and survive it? They know that we couldn't. But it's a way of manipulating the public through demagoguery of fear, jingoism, false nationalism, and creating a boogeyman out in space. Were you surprised when your daughter enlisted? Not at all. She's a born leader. I know I've been taking orders from her since she was five years old. So you don't worry about her? Of course I worry about her. I fought in the war in 96. I know what those things are capable of. But I know what my daughter is capable of. And I know this planet is safer because she's defending it. They could pull it off. They could definitely pull it off. Right now, they have the technology to mimic the form, fit, and function of extraterrestrial UFOs. They have the technology, absolutely. It's seamless, and you can never tell the difference. If they do have a false flag invasion, they're going to use one of these. This is the Hudson Valley Boomerang. This is 1982 to 1989. Over 25,000 eyewitnesses reported this craft. They can use the saucers, the cigars, the pyramids, the triangles as a united coalition and that's how they're, they're gonna do it. We're talking about 150 to 172 feet across for the wingspan, which is the identical wingspan of the B-2 stealth bomber. So the question we need to ask is, was some of that 22.4 billion used on the B-2 poured into this program? It's the exact same time frame when they power up and when they accelerate, um, it looks like a spark off a grinding wheel, and you could never know the difference. So if they wanted to hoax an alien invasion, they could do it, and they could do it in a way that's 100% believable. They started doing all kinds of psychological warfare entrainment of the public by staging hoaxed events, such as cattle mutilations. Oh, it's a flying saucer who did that. It's a covert paramilitary program, human. So if you wanted to start indoctrinating people into a false threat from outer space that Werner von Braun warned us about, you would start staging events that look alien, but that are completely man-made, that are scary, and scare the hell out of people. UFO encounters are categorized into four groups. Close encounters of the fourth kind include people who claim to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. If you had a close encounter of the fourth kind and you are back, we're anxious to hear from you. Inner stage left, you got these uh, sort of anti-gravity devices with creatures that look like ETs that are actually man-made robotic systems. They're called program life forms. And you start doing select interfaces with the public. We did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir. They came out and did that. They uh, had these uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects uh, antonomical defects that were uh, brought brought in to, 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 to fool people and thinking they're aliens. Yeah. Um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still, the program is still classified and they're, they're probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt, doubt it, they were still doing it. So they've already got this psychological warfare already embedded into the minds of people to expect 
an extraterrestrial, not a secret aircraft, but an alien craft. So when they do pull this, they'll already have everything ready to roll. These civilians got onto the base and, and got into something. They saw something they weren't supposed to see. And this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them. And staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. The government will use the extraterrestrial phenomenon to cover their own deep black programs. And so that's the fight that we're up against here. And then it makes it out through the, the movie industry and the UFO lore and the internet and what have you. And it starts creating the specter of a threat. from her, you bitch! <laughs> Pardon me, uh, are, are you from Mars? <laughs> it's a new move. <laughs> me, Dutch? It's a new move. The fact that you and I are still breathing the free air of Earth is abundant testimony to their restraint and non-hostility. Now the question is, how are these civilizations viewing us? Are they perceiving human civilization as a threat? And the answer is yes. Because I believe we've reached a point where we're a threat not only to our planet and each other, but we're also developing weapon systems that are potentially a threat in space. I just hope that uh, it's not like Independence Day. Yeah, right. Really, that it's a, you know, a, a conflict. Well, now we have friendly Maybe the aliens. only way to unite this incredibly divided world of ours. They're out there, we better think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we felt threatened by a space invader. That's the whole theory of independence. You're right, you're Everybody right. Everybody gets together and makes nice and, you know. You and Bill O'Reilly would be hiding in a bunker together. <laughs> the most dangerous thing going on on the planet today isn't ISIS, it's not Iraq, it's not Russia, it's not China. It's a out of control, covert group that is not being overseen by the people, the Congress, or the President who have developed these technologies and are recklessly using them to track and target extraterrestrial vehicles. The result of this is that we're in a crisis that is unacknowledged, ironically, because these projects are unacknowledged. What do you do? Do you talk to your congressman? Do you write your senator? Do you march on the White House lawn? What good is that going to do if the people who run this government don't have access to the programs? They're not cleared for it. So that's just not the direction to go. We better not get this one wrong, because this could be a threat to all life on Earth if we, if we are reckless with this issue. We need wise elders that are humans dealing with this situation, and the sociopaths that are in control of those programs can't be allowed to speak for planet Earth and for humanity. Resting power from the hands of these powerful oligarchs and corporations is going to require a revolution. One of the more hopeful events that happened over the last decade was what I call the French Initiative. I get a letter from the Ministry of Defense, and it's dated 16th of January, 2007, urgent. And it's signed by Admiral Pierre Morin. And he was in charge of providing briefings on this issue for then President of the French Republic, Sarkozy. They learned protocols to make contact with these civilizations for peaceful engagement. So here you have a major country, a nuclear power, making a commitment to do this. And we eventually go to France, and under the cover of a quasi-public event, 
the Admiral and his assistants are there, and we do our, the protocols for contact. And they track ET craft coming overhead at 200,000 kilometers an hour. But what it shows is that governments around the world can actually do a lot if they wanted to, to break the mold of secrecy and do something helpful. And this is the proof that that's happened with a major country. This is arguably the most important UFO document in history. The irony of it is I couldn't disclose it for a, quite a while until that president, Sarkozy, was out of office and these folks were not in harm's way. There was a, an invitation extended uh, from the Vatican to some 40 world scientists to come to Castle Gandolfo outside of Rome where the Pontifical Observatory is. And they spent a week briefing the highest level uh, members of the Vatican. They came out with an official press statement. Extraterrestrial life is going to be discovered much sooner than anybody had previously expected. And for this reason, the time has now arrived for the beginning of a very serious discussion about the philosophical and theological questions that are posed to our human family by the discovery of extraterrestrial life. There are civilizations that we need to communicate with. And I think we've reached that point in our evolution as a, as a human race that we need to recognize that. And the thing that disturbs me is that the U.S is going to be a third world nation in, in that field if we're not careful by having all of this secrecy and refusing to set up any kind of diplomatic protocols as, as I know that you have called for and I believe in very strongly. The biggest event in the history of humankind is the discovery that we are not alone, that there are other living entities, intelligent entities, in this universe or other universes and that we aren't here alone. That's a huge, enormous discovery. I think it's long past time to open this up to the public. Give us information to the young people of the world in this country. They want to hear it. They want it. Give it to them. Don't hide it and tell lies and make stories. They're not stupid. They're not uh, young men that will panic. UFOs are as real as the planes flying over your head and uh, that it's time that uh, the United States government started uh, coming clean on what it's all about because uh, there are very important military and, uh, and economic issues uh, that have to be addressed. And how can you address a question which uh, relates to a subject that people don't even uh, really won't admit exists? And it's a, it's a mission that we as the baby boomer generation pass on to you. Humanity is at a crossroads. A choice between endless war, war in space, growing poverty and environmental destruction, or a future where we explore the stars, live in peace with each other and our planetary neighbors. The technology is there. The solutions to Earth's urgent and long-term potential problems are there. The technologies will change the macroeconomic system. Because visualize for a moment, you're at your home, all your power needs are being provided from one of these zero point or quantum vacuum energy systems. Your car is running, never has to be plugged in. You then can have agriculture and manufacturing locally that has very little cost to it. And this is not just in the U.S., but in places that aren't yet developed, the so-called third world or developing world, they're going to leapfrog right over the smokestack industries and go to high tech, real high tech, just like they've skipped over telephone lines and gone to smartphones. This will be a tie that will lift all ships. The world will be increasingly interconnected, and yet on the local level, it'll be completely self-sufficient, every village, every home. And this is something that is the biggest change economically in the history of the human race. It's a big nut to crack, but I think that if you could do that, I think that people would stop looking at each other with a certain level of hostility like we do now. I guess it's kind of corny, but it's that bright future that I see that we could all attain 
if just a few things could be changed. Imagine interplanetary trade, how exciting that would be. You have to adjust your cosmology, you have to adjust your whole concept of, of our human species being at the apex of all bio, biological evolution in the universe. And you also have to, of course, modify your judgment that the entire universe was created just as the stage upon which the drama of the human development is unfolding. That There's a lot more going on in the universe than just that. This is why it's time for the people to lead the whole ending of the secrecy and do the disclosure. As we, the human family, confront the reality of extraterrestrial life, it is perhaps worthwhile to reflect. Was our doubt really due to a lack of evidence? Or merely a lack of imagination?